was my favorite scene I couldn't tell you what it means But it meant something to Hi, welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and as always, I'm joined by Tom Roberge of Riff Raff. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm uh, pretty well, yeah. Recovered from this past weekend? Recovered. The store seems to have recovered from the uh, incident there, so everything's good. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that is that is good. That, how is it going with the store? Any new updates on like things that you've found out about or learned from uh, your time as a as a store owner? Um, nothing. People are weird. That's all I can say. You know, uh, bookstores by their nature attract a very weird crowd of people who want to talk about really obscure esoteric things at length. And then adding alcohol and a bar to the mix makes it so they, they want to hang out even longer. Um, <laughs> And I was prepared for this, having worked in bookstores for a while, and but my bartenders were not. And uh, oh. I remember saying the first couple of days, like, oh my God, what the hell's going on? It's like, yeah, just get used to it. That's just what it is. So, <laughs> anyway, that's all I will uh, That's all I will say about that. But you, we wanted to talk about a couple things today. I mean, as we, as we talk, just to pull the curtain back a little bit, I'm putting the finishing touches on the email that's about to go out to whatever 16,000 people about the winners of the best or the long listed titles for the best translated book award. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit, but also you wanted to start by talking about an email that you got. Yes. Which I should clarify. It wasn't just an email. It began with a phone call, okay. which this is all part of the larger sort of hook, I believe to the whole thing is, um, I've been debating whether or not to just say the name. Uh, I can't imagine this will get back to them. And, you know, if they want to call me out, call me out. So there's a new press called Analog C, mm -hmm. um, who bills themselves. Their website is literally just, uh, this is the entirety of their website. Analog C is an offline publisher of printed books. Our titles can be found in many independent stores worldwide. To receive a copy of our latest catalog or to propose a project, please do send us a letter and there are two addresses, one in Germany and one in Austin, Texas. What? That's it. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> so I get a phone call. I'm at the store, and uh, a woman with a, a very obvious German accent is on the other line telling me that she works for a new publisher, blah, blah, blah. They would like to send us a free copy of a, of a book to check it out, and you know we can go from there. And in context, I will say that this, this is a sort of interesting sort of way to go about it because this is not usually how um, these little presses sort of approach bookstores. Usually it's, it's much more heavy handed and um, forceful and, uh, you know, they're sending you books unasked for. They're sending you, you know, boxes of books you didn't ask for, they're, you know, telling you exactly how they can get your book right from the get-go and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of didn't ask for in those statements. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, that's how it, some people think that that's just the way to do it. And yeah. it's, it's it's really not. Um, anyway, so she was perfectly nice. Um, and the book shows up about three weeks later. And it is a, a very beautiful little package of a book and a letter-pressed uh, letter. Mm -hmm. Um from the publisher. And uh, so I read through this whole thing and it's all about how he wants to unplug and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they don't want to do eBooks and et cetera, et cetera, which I'll say my, my summary again. So I get to the end of this and I read the name and I can't remember what it is to be honest right now. It's sitting at the store and I was like, okay, seems like a nice guy. And then the, the, the sample book is authored by none other than the guy who wrote the letter. Ah, uh, yep. So it becomes obvious that this is a sort of vanity press sort of thing. Um, but what I think is interesting and we're talking about is there is a lot of ways that he has chosen to do this vanity press that I think are very different and very interesting and taking advantage of some of the things that are going on in the culture um, 
especially in our little corner of the publishing world. Mm -hmm. One, he has an he has an uh, office in Germany, even though he's very clearly American. Right. Right. Like that's that's going to appeal to a certain demographic. Right. Yeah. Two, hired a German employee. So this is the woman who gets on the phone. It's not, you know, I didn't talk to Jim Thompson or whatever his name is from Austin, Texas. I talked to German woman with German accent, right? So it lends it even more sort of international flair slash credit, right? Yeah. Then it's got this fancy letterpress sort of thing. Like they're clearly spending money on this and, and the quality and all of that sort of thing. And on top of that is this very anti online sort of, you know, uh, approach to the whole thing, which is very strange to me. This seems so incredibly niche. And yet if his goal is just to be taken seriously as one of these types of publishers, it's probably going to work. Yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, not everyone is going to be quite so cynical as I am. Um, the book was, you know, a beautiful package and all of that. I imagine he's not only going to be publishing his own poetry. Um, they claim that they're also doing a um, literary journal and we're asking for submissions and things like that. So I bet they go ahead and, you know, make a little little name for themselves in this corner of the world. But I don't know. I just thought it was all very – it feels like there's like a Wizard of Oz thing going on here um, <laughs> that I, I find distrustful and do not like. yeah. It's hard to take any of those things seriously. I mean, not having a distributor is a big signal, I think. Like, if you yeah. have, even it's if you have SPD, yeah. it makes sense. Like, you have something. Right. And, if it, the, and you said that you had to, like, it's, it asked you to write to them for a catalog? Yes. <laughs> Which is awesome. Because I don't remember the last time I've written a letter. Actually... Actually, my daughter wrote a, a fan letter last night. She hand wrote it to a, an author who wrote back to her a handwritten letter. So I was like, but they but they sent them via messenger <laughs> as pictures. So not quite the same, but yeah, writing a handwritten letter to get a catalog makes no sense. Yeah, it just seems a little a little too far. And one of the things in the um, letter that he had written was this this discussion about. Um, distribution as a weird sort of uh, deflection, I will say, even though that's not really what the, the 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 sentiment he was trying to express was that they were finding it very impossible to get distribution without immediately being thrust into the world of online uh, sales. Right? Oh, so if you signed up with Ingram Publisher Services, for example, you're not just available through Ingram your metadata instantly goes up to Amazon. Right. Essentially, if you, make your Am if you make metadata available, it will be pulled up on Amazon. Yes. Which I thought, huh, this is interesting. I'm going to go check. This book is available on Amazon. Oh, it is? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's unavoidable, apparently. That is too or perfect. He's being hypocritical. I, I suspect it's probably the former, that he didn't intend it to go up there. and it just It just went up there. Yeah, yeah, I can see that happening. I and mean, what could you do? Like, is there, is there anyone, aside from, like, Ugly Duckling does a good job of keeping certain other books off of Amazon. I don't know how they do that. I will say it's very hard to order their books. I so don't think that they have ISBN numbers on those ones. That's exactly the case, I think, is is what it comes down to. We have problems, I have problems with what to do with those in the translation database, because I can't enter them. Because if you don't have an ISBN number or an individual record, you, there's no identifying marker for like a singular number for that book. Um, so I never enter those. They're usually not the ones that are uh, translated anyways. Um, they're usually something special or unique that isn't, isn't necessarily translated, but it is, it is a tricky situation. But I think that's the only way you can do it. Is you just like, yeah, and I mean, there must be thousands of people that do that. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I think I about it. Can you... You can't be registered through the Library of Congress if you don't have an ISPN either. Right, but you don't, yeah, you don't, I mean, I guess there'd be an underground of people who, like, hand print books on letterpress, uh, letter presses, and, like, distribute them just on their own way, that just don't register with anyone. They're just making their friend's poetry available through, in this beautiful way, in this form, 
uh, and just giving it out or selling it individually and not even pretending to like make it available wider than that, like a true micro press. Right. It's not, not unlike zines back in the day. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I remember, uh, I remember my, I went to uh, college with the woman who started Venus magazine, Amy Schroeder. She lived on our sister floor, actually. And I think I'm in the second issue of that magazine, but it was like a zine like that where it was printed and stapled and just truly old school zine and then became like this very popular magazine for a period in the early 2000s, which is kind of always a little bit crazy. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a, a history of these things. We have at the store now... Um, reproductions of a Bay Area zine that was called uh, How to Score. Oh. It was like, you know, super underground culture about how to, you know, get drugs, basically. Yeah. Um, that became a sort of, you know, keepsake for a lot of people from a certain time and place. Um, but they're beautiful little things. You know? that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think we're going to go back towards that culture as like, if people are that just uh, wanting to di disentangle from like Facebook and to a different extent, Amazon um, in a different way. Do you think people will start going back towards that mode of, of creation and sharing their projects? Or are we just too far gone now that like because of Patreon, because of things like that, where you need some sort of funding, you enter into a, a larger marketplace and you can't really avoid some of these things. I wish I knew an answer to that. I would say this, that in Providence, Rhode Island, in the year 2018, there is a thriving um, letterpress and zine culture. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of these things these people are printing. I don't know. Um, I mean, clearly, it's not a way to... Um, like These are done out of charity, basically. Like, yeah. You know, they're... No one is making, probably most people are not even making their money back for the oh, material yeah. spent and hours spent making these things. In fact, the only people <laughs> making any money on this situation are me and the other booksellers who sell these things, now that I think about it. <laughs> and the printers. Um, well, yeah, I guess. I'm not even sure about that. <laughs> um, but I don't know how driven it is by a desire to disengage from that sort of stuff. Yeah. And less and more a, a, a desire, just a nostalgic sort of tendency to enjoy um, the tactile sort of thing. And I don't think it's necessarily a reaction. It's just that it never left a lot of people. Do you right. Know what I mean? right. Yeah, that's true. There's... We have a lot of makers in this area because it's yep. cheaper to open um, shop space, basically, than it is in Boston and New York. And so you get a lot of like fabricators, whether it's metal or wood or yeah. whatever potters and things like that who move here because it's cheaper to live here yeah. and to open their spaces. And, um, those kind of people tend to like those kind of books. Right. So yeah, I don't we, know, but it's, you know, we're just one little city on the East coast. I don't know how, how widespread this is going to become nor because of the very nature of it, how it could, you know, all of these things sort of have to happen independently, um, from other cultures in other cities because you're, you're not going to be collaborating online or whatever. Right. So, right. And there's absolutely like, I mean, there's even here, there's two giant buildings that are, um, old. Uh, one of them was an old button factory, I believe, or a sort of fabric factory of some sorts. And then the other one, I don't know what it was, but it's, it's huge. And they're all cheap artist studios. I mean, I think fairly cheap. I don't know. I don't know how comparison. I've never looked at them, but they have like open, open days of the month where you can go through and see everyone's studios and all the stuff that they're making. And there's like a thriving sort of culture of that. We have a lot of that stuff and we're not a big city. Um, and we do have like a number of these letterpress sort of presses. And it, it's, it is kind of interesting because it does mean that you're insanely local. Like you're, it's like, it's, it's your, your whole radius of readership is like, the people that you can see like from where you made the made the the book or the object which is it's just kind of interesting we have like a press small press fair here in fact every summer and there's usually like 40 presses there and 39 38 of them you've never heard of they're like little things along these veins um but it's kind of interesting because it is there's i don't know what exactly about this interests me but there's something about the idea that people are trying to do this on this little way and then there's like detention because if you're not on Amazon, if you're not selling broadly, you kind of are 
discounted by most people, even people within our industry. Like we're doing a, a huge writers conference here. The latter um, is what it's called. If anyone's interested, you can come to it. Um, it's like a day long thing. That's like a mini AWP with a lot of like sessions and um, meeting with agents and that kind of stuff. And there's a tension between like getting a lot of people here because we're going to appeal to a lot of people from Syracuse, Buffalo and Rochester are the ones who are, are registering for it. And um, they're all like want to be writers. And I have that sort of knee jerk reaction of like, we're bringing in people that I really respect or like as agents and as writers, as people. And you're like, I hope that you find something valuable here. And it's not just like these very small town self-published uh, things that are not very good. And I know that that's not true because I know there's good writers everywhere. I know that people that are not part of the scene yet will become part of the scene. There, there's no reason to think that every single person who signs up for this conference is going to be, you know, a terrible writer, but there's, there's that, that weird, sensibility right it's funny you mentioned the that no one will take you seriously if you're not on amazon or whatever i actually have the opposite reaction where we get so many um mostly local um authors who are pitching their um for all intents and purposes self-published books mm -hmm. to the store whether it's just you know to be on the shelves or as uh for events and that sort of thing. And I, I understand that they're, they're largely doing spam sort of emailing of bookstores, right? They just Googled yeah. bookstores, Rhode Island and sent an email to all whatever 30 of us in, in, you know, in an hour and that they're not truly trying to understand like the culture of our store or anything like that. But putting in an Amazon link to your self published book while emailing an independent bookstore with fairly <laughs> oh, less, yeah politics it's just <laughs> such a horrible look that i immediately discount anything they might have to say yeah yeah yeah. i'm not thinking of it from the as a bookseller taking it seriously i mean more as like a general reader like right. a uh, like someone who's like reading and keeping up i remember like and this is a this is one of those weird reversals of that is when sergio de la pava's um naked singularity we got the the first printing of that because he self-published it. it's a giant have you read this book do you know what i'm no. talking oh fuck dude you need to get this book. It is so good. It is one of the, it's amazing. You like Pynchon or Gaddis, it's in that vein and it's wild and it's sort of a crime caper of sorts, but it has like these amazing voices of these amazing um, downtrodden people because the main character is like a night uh, lawyer for like people involved in like night court sort of situations. Um, and it's so good and so funny and amazing. And it's like 600 and some pages. It's a giant book. Um, it reads really fast though. And it, uh, he did it on his own and like self published it through whatever contraption was around at that point in time. Um, and sent it, he had, I think his wife sent it to like 20 or 30 different, maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's a hundred, let's say, um, bloggers and writers and people who are like sort of into this kind of literature. And I got a copy, like she sent it to me and I was like, well, it's not really translated. So we don't really write about it. And I set it aside and didn't really do, pay attention to it. Um, and then, and, and thought, well, it's self-published. It's probably, you know, fine, but whatever. And um, eventually, like, a bunch of people were mentioning how good it was. and ended up getting picked up by University of Chicago. Um, and I read it and was like, and I got the University of Chicago version because I lost the galley. I lost the version that you sent me. I don't know where it is. It used to be somewhere in a box. That box might still exist. Probably not. Um, and so I bought the, the Chicago one and read it and was, like, blown away. Like, absolutely blown away. And his new book is coming out next month. And I'm going to be reading that for um for review for uh for uh uh what do you call it quarterly conversation and um it's published by pantheon like he really was one of these like true success stories that's not of the like uh what's that one guy's name john locke like who wrote all those crappy mysteries and self-published them and like did it on amazon for 99 cents and got picked up by some major publisher like that's just kind of schlocky stuff this is like legitimate literature and he started out as a self-published author and really truly made it and in every, you know, in every form. Um, and that's super cool that that can happen. Um, but initially, like when that came, I, I think I had that knee jerk, like, oh, I'm sure it's kind of crappy because he had to publish it on his own. Right. Well, this is also, I mean, I remember when this happened, this was like 10 years ago. So things have changed a little bit. With that book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our attitudes shifted a little bit towards those types of phenomenon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, what did you, what did you do? Do you have a hot take on the Donald Trump attacking Amazon? Um, 
tweet that sort of like is is both like I think for stores like yours be like oh you know right on and also like ah I don't want to be on his side. I mean, my hot take is that it's very obvious that he's not on my side. He is just <laughs> opposed to what he perceives as the Washington Post's editorial board. Yeah. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. it. It's nothing beyond anything but the Washington Post. That's it. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Because. And also, I mean, it's just another one of these things where, like there's there's nothing you can do really about any of this because most of the. OK, let me step back up. I think Amazon is now paying tax in like 45 or 50 states. Yeah. Right. That's right. More tax that's, that's collecting sales tax. Collecting sales tax. Yeah, I mean, wow, paying, talk- paying corporate tax is different, right? The giant corporate tax breaks that they get for opening their um, fulfillment centers. I wish we would just use the word warehouse because that's what it is, right? And the employees are treated like warehouse yeah. managers in every regard. Anyway, the fulfillment centers are, um, you know, given these massive tax breaks by municipal uh, boards. And so they aren't paying those taxes. But there's literally nothing that president of the United States can do about any of that, right? And this is like the long-term problem that people have been right. talking about for years. Because like when I was in business school, which is not the best choice in my life, but um, they they one of the classes was about how you should do – it was like a class that sort of veered into ethics. And the ethics that they promoted are ethics that no one – none of us would ever want to promote. Like they're all like a little bit – you know, just savage, just savage enough where you feel uncomfortable. And they're like, well, why not? The goal of a corporation is to make as much money as possible. So the ethics are to make as much money as possible without violating the law. So there's like ones about like paying corporate tax. And they're like, 100% get all your money offshore, do whatever you need to do to never pay a dime of tax, period. That's the most ethical stance. And And that's what like Apple does, Google does. All these places pay like some amounts because they can't get away with everything. But like they're all gearing up for that and um and they they would love to do that and i think amazon's in that same boat so it's like that whole system and there's all that talk for a while but like the corporate tax rate is too high and that's why people are moving their money and having locations in ireland or elsewhere because the tax is lower so they're not paying it to the u.s but they're benefiting from u.s uh policies and from the workforce and how do we get them to bring their money back over here to pay tax on it to help it create you know support the infrastructure and educational systems and all that kind of stuff and like every president seems to have some sort of game plan for this but i don't know what, <laughs> what the answer to that would be so he could theoretically do something but i don't I, you know it would have i don't know what that would be you can't you can't force a corporation to relocate its headquarters. No, you have to incentivize them to bring their money back over here. Incentivize them. I mean, what does that even mean? Um, I don't know. It's one of these things. We've gotten a little off track, but yeah. I think um, the whole point is that Trump is just worried about the, the Washington Post, which is weird because he doesn't seem to actually care about newspapers in so much as he just <laughs> thinks they're all garbage. <laughs> all against him. It felt like just a dog whistle, honestly. It's yeah. just an Get another one of those, like, don't trust Jeff Bezos sort of things so that, you know, the off chance that some of, I don't even know who these mythical people are who are, like, on the fence about whether or not to listen to the Washington Post's editorials about how bad Trump is might be encouraged to agree with Trump. Right. Maybe. I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't anyway. know either. Um, on the good side of things... Uh, the best time of the book award long list is announced in just a minute. And we do have funding again from Amazon from their literary partnership program. Um, so there will be $20,000. Oh no. Wait a second. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Okay. Good. Whew. It's, uh, good. Never mind. I looked at the wrong press release that's sitting on my desk. I was like, all the information is wrong. I just sent out the wrong email, but that's not true. Um, it's all okay. All okay. The um, the they they are donating again or giving us a grant through the Amazon Literary Partnership. So we'll have given out five thousand dollar cash prizes to the winning authors of the fiction and poetry division and their translators. So now the total will be one hundred and sixty thousand dollars given to those those individuals, international writers and translators over the period that Amazon has been funding the award, which is a pretty significant number. Like that's that's nothing. I mean, greater scheme of things, sure, but like that's nothing to like. 
to, to snooze at or laugh at, um, which is pretty cool. And if you want, I don't know that we need to read all the 37 uh, long-listed titles since um, poetry has 12 and fiction has 25, and people can find this on the millions who will be announcing the, they announced the, the long list right now, um, today, Tuesday, and then they'll be doing the short list on May 15th, and then we'll have the winner will be announced on the millions and at the New York Rights Fair on May 31st. All that information's available online and in this oh, email. Really? During Book Expo? During New York Rights Fair, the, the competitor. Whatever. I will be there. Yep. I, that's right. awesome. May 31st. All right. Yep, but like, um, it'll be early can, afternoon. Can I just say that I, I don't know how much like space we have for discussion about this, nor, I mean, people can read this. I'm sure it's much more interesting than listening to us read these off. Yeah. Um, especially because it is a, a long list. And yeah. 25 of these in fiction and then 12, I think, is what it is for the poetry. Yeah, I don't understand. Whatever. <laughs> The poetry one is never the same. It's always a different number. <laughs> Just want to say that um, I was <clears throat> pleasantly surprised reading this list half an hour ago that uh, Ebola, Ebola 76 is on here. Oh, yeah. By That's... Amir Tag Elsir, who was on here a few years ago. Don't yep. make me remember which year exactly for uh, French perfume. So Exactly. Um, is that the same translator from the Arabic? Don't think so. Um, I, I can tell you there. in two seconds, though. Um, I don't think it is. But and it's a different publisher. Uh, correct. The I don't know them. Darf Darf does crazy stuff. They're fun. They're in India, um, yep. and they've done a few books that have been. I think they have had a few books on the long list actually before. Um, French perfume was translated by William Hutchins and was from Anti Book Club in 2015. Right. Um, by the way, for anyone listening to this, you can uh, almost, by the time this goes live, theoretically, this will be all done, but I've been coding the translation database that when you go to it on PW, there's options down below that say, like, you can check BTBA long list, finalist, and winner. I'm putting in all the data for all the past years. I'm almost caught up. Like, I'm very, very close, and it should be caught up by the time this goes live. Um, but you'll be able to search for, like, how many Spanish books were on the long list and get that number how many, what books are on the long list on these given years, all that will be available. Um, so it will be easy to see like how many of his books have made it before or how many from Darf have made it before. Um, which in fact, I can tell you that right away. Darf has none because maybe I haven't done that year yet, but I think they had, they had one at some point in time. So looking at the list though, which ones are you high on and which ones are you surprised by and which ones are you disappointed aren't there? I can't think of anything disappointed by except, I mean, the obvious one would be such small hands, but yep. I, I don't. I can see why it wouldn't be on this list. See, I, I had just, that as my my front runner. I thought that would win. <laughs> I mean, no, but then you see these other books on a list like Frazan, and you're like, oh, well, yeah, no, that that's yeah, the Frazan book no is good for what it is, but it is no Rodrigo Frazan. Like, right. I get that. I totally understand that. Doesn't mean it maybe shouldn't have been on this list of twenty five. But... I want to say that there are eight Spanish books on this list. I'm, looking, I'm seeing a lot of Spanish. Right. There are, I'll read them all, and we can just count them. Affections by Rodrigo Hasbun, translated by Sophie Hughes. August by Romina Paula, translated by Jennifer Croft. Um, scanning down. Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin, translated by Megan McDowell. Uh, Iliac Chris by Christina Rivera Garza, translated by Sarah Booker. Invented Part by Frazan, translated by Will Vanderheiden. Um, Magician of Vienna by Sergio Pitol, translated by George Henson. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, Return of the Dark Valley by Santiago Gamboa, translated by Howard Curtis. Savage Theories by Polo Olicaric, translated from the Spanish by Roy Kesey. And that's it. But that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of Spanish books. Yeah, I've read several, several of those. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. There's also, you know, a decent amount of French here. A couple yeah. feminist press books. That's Three cool. feminist press books. They are, yeah, they were tied for the highest... Um, Press with the most books on this list because they have Chasing the King of Hearts by Hannah Kral, translated from the Polish by Philip Bohm, or I think that's how you say it, Bohm. Uh, the that August by Romina Paula aforementioned um, is from them as well. And then there's one more, and which one was it? Oh, Iliad Crest, of course. Yeah. 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 So they're, yeah, they're crushing it. Okay. My, I just, it, 
whatever influence this has, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry if it affects anything, really don't want Fever Dream to win. <laughs> you, you are so not alone in that sentiment. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even begin okay. to tell you. Um, what's, your, what's your Fever Dream reaction? We, you know, we were the first ones to publish her. We did her short story in uh, our anthology, The Future Is Not Ours, like shit, like almost 10 years ago now. Well, somebody fell in love with writing at uh, Riverhead. My, I just, I did not enjoy that book. I really just could not, could not get on board with uh, the way it was written and the style and everything. <laughs> just didn't, didn't enjoy it. I don't understand the hype. There's a lot of hype behind that too. There is a lot of hype. And it's, yet again, fucking Riverhead. So. I, why? I mean, people, they... I don't want to diss on Riverhead too much, but like the amount of like praise that they get for their things is so outsized. Like it's it really, so outsized. Yeah. And like I've uh, been on panels with them before and they're like, it's not hard to sell translations. We just do them and they're fine. And it's like not, that's just definitely not the full picture. And, um, and it's, it makes me like resent some of their books more than I should. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it as well. Um, they have so much money behind everything they do. That's just kind of absurd. Um, and they pick a certain kind of book. Let's just say that. Yeah. Know? Although isn't Alvaro Enrique's book would maybe not fall into that category. And I don't think that one did quite as well as the others. I agree. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> this is true. Um, Daniel Kelman's <laughs> back on here. He comes back every so often. Daniel Kelman, he's a German writer. He's yeah. um. He's always been sort of popular on the edge of fringes of it in a lot of ways, and uh, he always shows up. And I, it's always I always find it funny because he had a probably poorly probably a quote that he, he that he regrets now about um, being a finalist for an award. I forget what award, award it was, but he didn't win. And he had some say, thing saying it's worse to be on a list and not award and not win it because it damages your career as like the person who lost that award, or than it is to be on a short list or be a finalist. <laughs> It's like an absurd. That's certainly not true. <laughs> it's an um, absurd idea. But he was like, you know, twenty four and or thirty two right. or whatever, and you know, fiery, which uh, I can respect. I'm not seeing any New York Review of Books books. I know. I was actually surprised by that too. Um, it's just I, not done anything um, that's new. Is that the issue? Let's maybe? see what was even available. So these are from twenty seventeen. And just fiction, um, they had seven items that were avail that were seven uh, titles that were eligible: Melville by Gian Giono, Communist by Guido Morselli, Notes of a Crocodile by Mao Jin Ki, Ernesto by Umberto Saba, Uncertain Glory by Juan Salas, Late Fame by Arthur Schnitzler, and Catalan Street by Magda. Is did you say Sabo? Sabo. Um, I assume. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, those are strong. I'm surprised not one of those are on is on here. I would have put Notes of a Crocodile I taught in my class last week, and I would have put that on here for sure. The only reason I thought of it is because I'm looking at this uh, Burgeoners by uh, Espadal, and it just seems like that's their kind of book as well, and I would have thought, you know, something from New York Review of Books. But yeah, yeah, it's true. It, it is surprising. That Burgeoners book sounds fun. I don't know... If it how what it actually reads like, but we've had it around, and I think we ran a review of it over the summer. But it seems like a book that could be kind of fun, you know, not not super dense, not super overwhelming, but decent. But yeah, that is strange that NYRB isn't on here. They send in all their stuff. I know that they submitted all these books yes. many times, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, the, 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 did you see the controversy? So we have Remains of Life by Wu He, translated from the Chinese by Michael Berry, who's a Taiwanese author. From Columbia, did you see the the controversy about the Man Booker International, where the one author wanted to be identified as being from Taiwan, and they replaced it with Taiwan, comma China, because China told them like, no, you can't do that, <laughs> you can't be from Taiwan. Interesting. And the huh. Man Booker conceded and was like, okay, fine, they're they're not from Taiwan, they're from Taiwan, comma China, and the guy was pissed. Yeah, well, <laughs> no sticky issue. Yeah, not uh, interesting. Who do you? Anyone that you, anyone else that you're surprised by? I and mean, then some of the other ones that are on here that there's two books from two lines, which is good. My Heart Hemmed In by Marie Ndiaye, which always, I always feel like she's going to win at some point in time. I don't, yeah, I keep, I, I, her books, 
they just feel small in some ways because yeah. they do they focus on little small things and I don't know, maybe it just needs the right collection of judges, but I think that the tendency is to go towards, you know, big sort of earth shattering sort of books. That's true. I mean, not that you don't occasionally get something, um, like the, um, a God, I'm blanking on his name, but, uh, the Mexican one from a couple of years ago that was, oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. Herrera. Happens, but you know, generally it's this big crush and horkai sort of, you know, impressive thing, right? Yeah, that's true. Confessions of Noel Weber was pretty small. The Gail Haraven, that's really a great book, but yeah, it's particular. A lot of these other ones are pretty big. Um, yeah. It's interesting. It's nice to have like the um, a book from Coach House on here as well. Yes. Well, Emma was fearful that there wouldn't be any French Canadian on here, and so I'm glad yeah. that that's there. So. Yeah, I think with uh, Patrick Smith as one of the judges, there's always going to be a French Canadian, right? Yeah, that's probably his wild card you're probably right that's the other thing that happens is like you get those 16 books and then these nine wild cards and so like if new york review books wasn't on one of those 16 and it's not the number one pick from anyone right you get left out like there's there's ways that you fall through the cracks even though it feels like there's a ton of books on this list right um yeah there's it's funny because i have three of these books in my class and i i knew this list Thursday morning when I went to teach last time and I told them that three of the books that we we're using in our class are going to be on the long list. Can you guess which ones? They guessed zero of them. <laughs> really? Yep. They picked three other books uh, every time. They picked uh, Notes of a Crocodile, Such Small Hands, and then what was the other one they kept going back to that they're like convinced was going to be on here? I forget what it was, but they haven't. we hadn't read Compass yet, so forgive that one, but Beyond the Rice Fields by Naivo was on here and that we had read and then... Um, what is the other one that we're doing? Oh, geez, now I'm blanking out too. What is it? Oh, I'm the brother of XX. We talked about that day. So we literally just talked about the book that's on here, and they they didn't think that it was going to make it. Um, all right. Should we move on? Yeah, yeah. Talk about this more in a, in a few weeks. Absolutely. Oh, should you say anything about the poetry, though? I don't really, you know. I don't know what to say. I don't know enough about any of these books, sadly. It exists. I was trying to write a thing about, I was trying yeah. to read poetry uh, in translation this month for April and write about it. And it's hard because I don't have the terms and I don't, and I know that I sound stupid. Like it, it's, it's really hard. It, I can understand now better. I think I'm going to try and finish writing a, a post about this where I understand better how people feel when we talk about like, oh, you should just read you know, these, these more difficult books, just go into them. It'll be fine. Like the, you can understand it if you just give these books a chance. And like, I do that with poetry. I'm like, I still feel like a fucking idiot. Like, I don't know what to say about this. I don't know how to talk about this. I have none of the, none of the ability to say anything other than that made me laugh. Right. Yes. Emma just walked by and said, you guys are just going to skip the poetry. And I think we didn't read the whole long list for the fiction. I, I don't, I, I will say that I do like Asse Berg, the, the Hackers by Asse Berg, translated from the Swedish by Johannes Göransson. Commune? What's that? What, who published that? Black Ocean. Black Ocean, okay. And I've read other Berg books, and they're gross and cool. They're like viscerally gross, and I, I like that. So I, I like that book being on here. I also like Johan. He's great. He's from, he does action books, which has a few books on here as well. Um, uh, I don't know. The other one that seems really curious is the Iron Moon by the by Chinese migrant worker poetry edited by uh, King Yao Yao. I'm not sure how you say that. Translated by Eleanor Goodman. Um, because I don't know what that is. Like, is that just a bunch of different authors that are Chinese migrants workers? I assume. Um, I don't know. The the copy is sitting in the other room. This might have been Emma's uh, wild card. Oh, to be cool. She really loves this book uh, and thinks it's fascinating. I like seeing white pine on there. White pine's from up here. They're in Buffalo. So that's always nice. Um, I don't know any of these other. <laughs> I know I've seen most I of them. I know all the publishers. I know some of these names, you know, but I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't knowledgeably discuss any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe tricky. We'll talk more about it in a couple of weeks when, especially okay. when the short list comes out. Cause then you can like, you can really hone in on it. 
I'll yeah. read the I'll read the poetry shortlisted titles for sure. I have an opinion. So what else? I've I've um if anyone who's listening, this is a this is a uh, sort of self promotional thing, but we finally, as of yesterday morning, have a job posting for an assistant marketing a uh, marketing assistant. Um, and it will be it's on it's going to be on the three percent website today later. Um, it's available through the University of Rochester's job search function. If you look for marketing assistant or open letter, you can find it. It'll be in various places soon. I had to wait for it to like go live on this thing. Cause you have to apply through HRMS at U of R. There's no other way to apply. You have to do it through there. Um, and so I had to wait for that to be available before I could do anything, but we will be hiring someone. So people are listening to this. If you have bookstore experience or publishing experience, you're into marketing, you want to help open letter, get its books out to a wider range of people dealing with all of our sales reps and, um, reviewers and all that kind of stuff in bookstores, you know, apply. We're looking for some really talented person who could take over and really, you know, bring us to the next level since we need that. And, uh, it's, it's hard enough to do all this stuff by myself. It'd be great to have someone here to help with all that. And if I can just chime in to say that this is not dissimilar to the job that I had for New Directions for um, a couple of years after I got away from doing publicity, which is, um, you know, review based and event based uh, marketing, especially in the terms you're talking about is, you know, making sure the books have a presence in independent bookstores, which is a fucking really fun job because you get to talk to booksellers all day and, and maintain those relationships and sort of really, um, it feels like good, honest work. You know what I mean? So it's a fun job for somebody looking to, um, do something slightly different in publishing. Yep. Absolutely. So apply, apply, tell your friends, tell your friends to apply. Um, that'd be great. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? You're going to talk about this article or do you want to just skip it? Stupid. I mean, we have like 15 minutes, so let's talk about this real quick. So Politico, which, okay, I'm going to, be honest here, did not know Politico was still a thing. <laughs> Politico published, this was on, I'm guessing, Friday? When was the 7th? April 7th. Uh, uh, it was Saturday. Saturday. Who publishes? Anyway. Is this like their weekend magazine kind of thing? Fuck anyway, if I know. Um, Lakshmi Varanasi, who I also do not know, um, wrote this fairly long article uh, with the title, How Trump is Shaking Up the Book Industry. America's literary bubble is rethinking its identity. And it, she goes into several sort of angles if, of the publishing world, um, sort of broad reactions that took various shape in reaction to uh, Trump, Trump being elected president. And yeah. one is basically, hey, we weren't paying attention to Trump voters, right? Which is yeah. just such an obnoxious sort of broad um, uh, s sort of stereotyping of Trump voters to begin with, that it just seems like a non-starter sort of argument. Because this article sort of frames publishing's belief of Trump voters to be um, basically, I don't know, Walmart employees in West Virginia, yep. right? Yeah, exactly. Just totally untrue. There are contractors down the street here in liberal Rhode Island who all voted for Trump. I have uncles in Connecticut who own their own businesses who voted for Trump. Like, it's just wrong, right? To yeah. think that the people that they weren't paying attention to and whose voices weren't being heard in literature are exclusively like red state sort of people, right? Yeah. Um, and that they are, and the idea is basically that, um, one, publishing is full of upper, you know, the East Coast elites, right? And that they were not paying attention to rural red state sort of middle America voices and that they're now trying to focus on them in order to give them voice in order to give them in order to understand the zeitgeist the, the national zeitgeist a little bit better yeah exactly this, right people are publishing these kinds of books and one of the ones they cited was what is his name Vance JD Vance yeah. um who's a mystery writer that's what I thought too, but I might be mistaking him for someone else. I think they're like courtroom thrillers. I could be, I could be totally wrong here. I'm not going to look it up. But he is from um, middle of nowhere. Actually, here it is, Middletown, Ohio, um, and became a you know he grew up in like you know rural poverty and then became a um, you know New York Times bestseller for all of his mysteries or whatever they are. And then, no, this is his only book. 
It, he's that's a different person, I believe. What really? Yeah. Oh. The, according to the wiki thing, this is just his only book um, that I'm seeing. Because I, I know there is a Vance that writes books like that as well, but I think it's a different uh, thing at the author beginning. J.D. Vance? Yep, he's a oh. venture capitalist, author, and commentator. Um, went to o- Ohio State, the Ohio State, and uh, Yale. So, <laughs> Anyway, yep. um, who wrote a memoir called Hillbilly Elegy, um, which has been on the bestseller list for 40 straight weeks, right? Crazy. So... So that happened. They're trying to publish novels by, you know, small town um, writers from all over the country and that sort of thing. But on the other side, you get the other reaction, which is, um, I forget who they talked to about this, where they're trying to publish more um, minority voices, for lack of a better term. Um, voices that aren't represented or haven't been represented in publishing for a long time. And this has been slowly building, I think, over the last five years anyway, just the culture was sort of moving in that direction. Like we need to publish more black writers and more immigrant writers and all that sort of thing. And then Trump got elected and became these, the people who are already focusing on that sort of redoubled their efforts and, and became even more committed to it. Yeah. So there's that happening. Then I don't know. What's the third? I'm trying to I'm not sure, but I can answer one other question just to go back to us. The person you're thinking of that we're thinking of as the mystery novels is J.A. Jantz. Jantz. Um, yeah, Judith Ann Jantz, who writes under J.A. Jantz, has written a ton of uh, mystery books, like Until Proven Guilty and Justice for All, Dismissed with Prejudice. Like, there's, like, probably 30, more than that. There's, like, a bunch of series. So that's And their their books look like, when you see it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's exactly it. But, like, Vance and Jantz and J.D. and J.A. are so close, it's easy to to merge yes. them but they're two different people, two different, two different genders, two different everything. Um, so, oh, and then, so the other angle to all of this is publishing more, um, politically driven stuff, whether it's novels or essay collections or anything like that, that does sort of try to, um, draw on the issues surrounding Trump and they reference, um, the end of Eddie, which is a French yeah. translation from, um, a, a writer who lived in, um, Marine Le Pen's sort of stronghold mm-hmm. uh, as a gay man and how he had to escape that sort of, you know, militant nationalistic um, culture in order to, you know, uh, you know, live his life in peace and basically do what he wanted to do. Then there's another thing about um, basically the Daniel Woodrell sort of phenomenon, which is he's the writer of Winner's Bone and some other books sort of in that vein pitched as sort of rural noir, uh-huh. which he can do because he's from the Ozarks, right? Right. A lot of people, you know, who don't come from those places or who, you know, grew up there as children and haven't been back and all of that sort of thing, uh, who try to do that sort of thing, end up with caricatures of um, crackheads and meth heads and things like that and just, you know, rough sort of fringe characters and that how that's not helpful and that sort of thing. Anyway, so this is a perfectly fine article about publishing trends since the election. I, I think it's, it's sort of broad enough that it, it doesn't make any sweeping assumptions um, because it does try to cover all of its bases. But of course, literary Twitter did not like the sort of baseline assumption that they're elitists. Yep. There's, I saw, the reason this came to my attention was a bunch of people being like, this article is stupid. Where do I even start with this stupid article that's so stupid? We're not elite. That's, that's wrong. You don't understand. Or like, there's something of like, they didn't, they talked to a very small range of people. I mean, the, the people cited in here are like, um, the head of, uh, uh, Riverhead saying like, there's too much, too many people from the East coast, the elites that are being heard. And then Lauren Stein, like, it's not like the most, is that they, it's not like they reached out to a wide array of publishing people, um, or this woman didn't, but like, but whatever, it seems like, it just seems like a totally just piece. It's just a thing that exists. And I don't, but people get upset about everything just constantly. Yeah. And so why not get upset about this too? Right. I mean, publishing has been incredibly elitist. That's, yeah. it's not untrue. And if this is, I mean, we are being specific here about New York publishing. I think yeah. what happens, you know, where you are, for example, or the, you know, the Minnesota, the Minnesota um, even a lot of the, the West Coast sort of publishers and the other, you know, small publishers around the country, are, 
it's very different, right? It's just a very different scene. But yes, New York City uh, publishing has for a long time been sort of fed pretty steadily by Ivy League schools. And I remember when I was trying to get into publishing and it was like everyone my age was all, I was competing with went to Yale or Harvard. All of them. Yeah. You know? And it seemed like, and they got the jobs at whatever vintage because their now boss also went to Harvard. And of course, of course, I mean, this doesn't, this is not wrong. This is incredibly accurate. Just things have been, people have been trying to address this for a few years now. Um, but it's very slow progress, very slow progress. Yeah. There's, there, so I was looking at some of the people getting upset about it, and one is saying the idea that working class fiction and or fiction centered on the rural poor hasn't been published is horseshit. You just na- haven't been reading it. Name a year and I'll tell you a book that should have been bigger than it was, um, which is maybe getting a different problem. Um, people saying uh, that's the, that it didn't shield properly shield the unnamed sources. Um, the choice of the word of gatekeepers was people I was interviewing. Um, and then the Lauren Stein quotes, which that is problematic. Yes, that is incredibly problematic. Um, I don't know. I just don't. I, don't. Shoot. These, I mean, yeah, the, the, whoever said that, you know, there are a lot of books that should have been b- bigger. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of books that should have been bigger. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, we we don't need to keep focusing on Jonathan Franzen, but Jonathan Franzen sells book. I don't know. It's a snake eating its tail, right? Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't yep. know where to even begin with this. I'm not going to think about this article after I close this tab on my browser and uh, yep. stop talking about it ever again. It's so, gone. It, I, I, I hadn't seen the, the initial outrage. I probably never would have. My life would have been no different. Exactly. I do want to say one thing, and then we're going to have to say this and then maybe revisit it in a week or so. Okay. Which is I saw on Twitter, and I don't know if it was in reaction to this or what, but um, – Patrick, uh, your judge, our friend, commented, and I think I didn't see what it was in response to, but he said, I'm still thinking about whether or not independent bookstores are elitist by their very nature. Oh. And yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that's a really interesting idea, right? Yeah, yeah. We should have because him on to talk about it. We, we need to, I think, sort of unpack that. Agreed. Um, because yeah, it's kind of true. Like we don't discount anything. Am I setting a barrier to access to literature because of that? You know? Right. And by the things that you choose to carry. Exactly. As a statement in, a, in and of itself. It's very, yeah, it is a, it's an interesting concept and one that like has a lot of pieces to it. I yeah. Think it's, Cause we, we talk about this in my like, class. We do a whole week of like, is Amazon the greatest thing ever? Is Amazon why do people say Amazon's evil? And you sort of like go through all the different stages of like how things work and from different perspectives. And like one of the ones that they, the students keep coming back to is like, they wouldn't be buying books if it weren't for places like Amazon because it's too expensive. Right. And I don't know that there's this huge audience out there of people who, who are not reading because they, they don't want to shop on Amazon and don't, and, and can't afford full price. Right? right. So I don't, I, I don't know. So it's, it's unclear who would be being elitist to, but I am serving a specific demographic by and large because I am asking people to pay full price for books. Yeah. And they're serving a totally different, well, not a totally different demographic, but a much broader demographic. They're serving a broader demographic. And, and, and to be clear, the the people who shop there might have different values when it comes to what art is worth. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm I'm trying to cater to people who actually do value literature, right, and are willing to pay the asking price for it because they understand the system that brought it to the table that it's sitting on, right? Maybe they don't understand the whole thing, but they understand somebody wrote this, somebody published this, those people deserve to be paid for their work, right? Yeah, yeah. And, like, it's not like Amazon's thing, though, it's not like those people aren't getting, we're still getting the money, we're getting less money. That's where it gets really tricky because, like, the author themselves isn't seeing a, a serious decline but if you buy a book from Amazon in, instead of from your store because we're getting basically almost Amazon's the same taking amount. the loss. Yeah, they're taking the loss. And, you know, I, I don't 
their their money situation is seems to be pretty flush right now. So I'm not, right. not sure that, that to worry about that. But um, there was that thing that we I found that Reddit thread that was sent to me of like someone talking about what to how to open a bookstore in Rochester, and half of the responses were like, "I go to the public library. I'm never going to go buy a book for full price. That's just stupid. No one here can afford that. It's a it's a dumb idea. Don't open a store." And then there is, I went to the cereal store. I went to the cereal comic book store. Oh, you did? I oh, did. So for anyone listening, there is a new store called Pop Rock because it's literally illegal to start a new business in Rochester and not include ROC as part of the, the title. And this one is a comic book coffee store with cereal, like lots of cereal. And my daughter loves cereal. So I told her when she's having a really bad day um, that I would take her there as like a, a treat. And so we went. And um, it's it's a perfectly fine like the, the like it's easy to start making fun of like part of their system is kind of crazy because you can apparently join a club for twenty dollars a month and read the comics that they have there or you can buy them I guess because she said I don't know that that's their full model by the way I think that 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 might be a change between the writing of the article and what they were what what's going on now because we went in there last night um and the owners were there and and the owner's wife and she was like the nicest person and like hung out and talked to Chloe for a while and Chloe got her bowl of like Cheerios with marshmallows on top and whatever. And they had everything there was for sale. She said like everything. And they had all the comics that were there. There weren't a ton. Um, but they had some sign that said like, uh, the whatever, like pop rock reading program, you can read these comics and it didn't have a price associated with it. So I'm just not sure what exactly. And they have like a video game section set up where you can sit and play old Nintendo games and um, it's basically just designed as a place, as a, like a community space, is what it what it felt like more so than a store. Um, okay. yeah. and, which has some value. I don't know if it's necessarily the same value for like as a bookstore when it's like this sort of culture, because there are a lot of places that are like this. Um, the com- most any comic book store is similar without the difference that they don't have coffee or or video games. But, you know, it's a place where a lot of people have traditionally like sat around talking about star Trek or whatever um but it was it was totally fine i don't know that i don't know how well they're doing but she claimed that on their opening night they had more than 40 people in there for hours on end waiting to like get their cereal and just standing around they couldn't they didn't have enough seats everyone's just standing around eating cereal okay opening night opening night debut sort of novelty is one thing um and sustainability is another but like the fact that they're too it it wanted them to be mean (laughs) So I could just be like, yeah, this idea is silly. But like, they were so nice that it's just like, ah, yeah, you know, it's cool. Chloe loved it. It's $3 for a bowl of cereal, which is exorbitantly expensive when you buy it from the store. But like, in contrast to like other things, it's not that big of a deal. So it's a place I can take my kids to like, you know, let them, you know, do something that seems fun and is pretty low maintenance. Fine. My life is now managed by like, What's the easiest way to distract my children and to cause me the least amount of suffering? It's funny. I'm gonna we're gonna end this podcast on an, on an anecdote. So this uh, friend of ours in Providence came into uh, the store yesterday, and he I guess he wanted to come get a book, and he was out with he has two kids, and I guess they would like split parenting duties, whatever he and his wife that day, and so he had his daughter, and he said. I had to bribe her to come to the bookstore because we don't really have like a kid's section. Yeah. So I had to bribe her, bribe her to come to the kid's store, to the bookstore with a, the promise of a donut afterwards. Yeah, there you go. And Emma said, well, that just sounds like something for you. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, that's how I bribe my kids to do things. But yeah, it's a win-win. He's like, I do it almost every single time. It's like, oh, I want to do this. Kids, you can get a donut. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredibly a, unhealthy. Do not, do not, and do not give your children donuts every time you want to do something. <laughs> Just don't do that. Find another option. There's a million things that are healthier than donuts. <laughs> like, that is the last thing children need. They are already fucking ramped up. Like, <laughs> well aware. So um, cereal, cereal seems totally okay when I was like, oh, she's going to order some of this crazy shit. And she's like, I want Cheerios. It's like, what? What? If we bought Cheerios, you would never touch that. And of course, for 50 cents, you got to put marshmallows on top, which is crazy. But whatever. That's better than a donut, I think. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> Anyways, okay. Well, in there, I got to go figure out how to teach Compass in like the next 35 minutes. So um, good for me. 
Um, and the a list is out there. Everyone can see it. You know, tune in, send us emails, send us comments, rate us on iTunes, follow us on Twitter, all that fun stuff, which I'm sure people kind of do um, already know about. And I don't know anything else to add. Nope. I'm on my way to New York to go uh, promote Emma's translation oh. of Not One Day oh, for shit. the uh, Albertine Prize. So Every single person who's listening, every person, you're, there are some of you. Actually, it would be funny. Like, if you hear this, email us and tell us you are listening. Go to Albertine's website and vote for Emma's book. Yes, please do. It is. Please do. Wait, what is the title again? I was just going to say not one not day. One. That's right, right? Yeah, not one day. Yeah, not one day. Um, and it's published by Deep Bellum. And do you say and Garetta? Yep. And it is available to be to be voted on for the Albertine Prize. And that would be awesome. So do that. Everyone that's listening, go vote now. We want her to yes. win. Yes, we do. All right. With that, I need to uh, get going here yep same here okay talk to you soon all right thanks later